There's no cheat code in existence more iconic than the Konami code. In games like Contra, you could get a big edge just by entering the correct sequence of buttons before starting the game. The code is basically a button combo like you'd see in a fighting game, and under the hood they work in much the same way. But it might surprise you to learn that the technique used to make both combos and the Konami code underlies pretty much all of game programming in general. Codes, controls, animations, levels, AI, pretty much anything you'd want to program in a game usually involves something called a state machine. A state machine is a model of computation that uses a finite number of states and transitions between those states to encapsulate a set of behaviors or actions. Let's take a look at an example. Take the blue doors from the original Metroid. Each one can be modeled as a state machine with two states, either opened or closed. The door transitions from the closed state to the open state when the player fires upon it and transitions back when the player exits. The red doors, on the other hand, can work a bit different and require the use of five missiles. This too can be modeled using a state machine, but instead of using two states and bouncing between them, you have a set of intermediary states to keep track of the missile hits before the door opens. Both of these are pretty simple examples, but they do a good job of showing how state machines work. The doors can be in one of many states, open, closed, or being pummeled by missiles, and the transitions between those states are triggered by player action. But like I said before, state machines are somewhat ubiquitous when it comes to game programming. So let's take a look at a bigger example. The title screen for The Legend of Zelda just hits different. The whole thing comes together to create this mood that's kind of amazing considering the year that this game was released. You know what else is amazing? It's pretty much just a bunch of state machines. The glowing Triforce and the waterfall are both achieved by animating these systems color palettes based on a set of time-based states. Each state has an associated color, and the transitions occur after a fixed number of frames, with the machines eventually working back to the initial state to create the looping effect. If you wait long enough, the screen will eventually fade to black. Behind this transition is another state machine that handles the initial fade, the hold, and the eventual blackout. All of these machines are rolled into a bigger, more abstract state machine that handles the transition from the title to the story to the treasures and back again to repeat indefinitely. Unless, of course, you press the start button. In that case, the controller input triggers a transition on an even bigger state machine that handles the overall state of the game itself. This allows the player to move from the title screen to the save select and eventually drop into the land of Hyrule, where a giant composition of other state machines handle all the animations, enemies, treasures, and general sense of adventure every time you play the game. So yeah, these things are kind of everywhere, which raises a pretty big question. How exactly are NES games programmed to use them? Whether it's a classic action-adventure game like Zelda, or a modern open world epic like Elden Ring, the code for most games is structured around the same core idea, the game loop. The loop works like a master clock, allowing the game to make decisions and update the action at set intervals. And it's here, when processing each tick, that state machines come into play. Roughly speaking, every time the loop is executed, a game makes a series of decisions and calculations based on the state of each machine. Using that information, it then performs a set of transitions and updates which handle things like controls, hit detection, and enemy movement patterns. With all the logic performed, most NES games then execute a separate drawing routine to update the video memory memory and ultimately change what's displayed on the screen. This rendering loop often uses another set of state machines to keep track of things like sprite animations, transitions, and palette updates. So when you break it down, an NES game can be thought of as two really big loops. One loop that updates the data for the game world, which is just a giant organized hierarchy of state machines, and another loop that uses this data, along with even more state machines, to visually project that world to the screen. Straight up, if you're not using state machines as the fundamental organizing principle behind your game's code, then you're doing it wrong. Hot takes aside, state machines are an amazing tool that you can use to understand and model even the most advanced games. And honestly, unless a game is really simple, if you try to think about all the things going on at once, it can be really overwhelming. State machines allow you to break things down one piece at a time until eventually you've built enough interconnected complexity that it goes from a set of disjoint automata to a beautiful and fully functioning experience, given you actually know how to design and code one of these things. Thankfully, once you have a firm conceptual understanding of how state machines work, that's the easy part. Kinda. Coding a state machine for an NES game usually requires two things, a place to store the state values in RAM, and a subroutine that's called every tick of the game's loop to handle the transitions. That said, most of the time you're not directly translating models into code, and it's often easier to break things down into more than one piece. A good example that illustrates this idea are the world maps from Super Mario 3. The first thing that stands out to me when looking at one of these maps are the level cards, and as you probably guessed, each one of them can be modeled as a state machine. The machine for each card is really basic, 
it can consist of only two states along with a single transition when you beat the level. The state data is just the answer to a yes or no question, so it can be stored in a single bit, and the transition routine is about as simple as it gets. Now, in the actual game code, maps are stored as a list of up to four screens, with each screen broken down into a 16 by 9 grid of tiles. The data for each tile determines what's drawn at that point in the map, whether it's a background element, a bonus game, or a playable level. To keep track of which levels have been completed, the game stores a giant bit mask in RAM that holds the completion state for pretty much every tile on the map. In addition to the levels, the value is used for the state of things like breakable rocks and unlockable doors. I say pretty much every tile here because technically it doesn't store the values for the eighth row, an unfortunate side effect of the way that they chose to store the data. So the bit mask is laid out as a list of columns, with each column represented by a single byte in the cartridge RAM. The bits of each byte denote the completion state for a single row in a given column, with the leftmost bit denoting the first row, the next bit the second, and so on. This works great until you reach the eighth bit, at which point you kind of need to make a choice. If you definitely need to store all nine rows for each column, then you're forced to add another byte. But this is kind of gross, because seven of the bits will be unused, and it doubles the size of the table. So instead, the Mario devs decided to just not store the values for one of the rows. Why they chose to omit the eighth row instead of the ninth is anyone's guess, but my thought is that it had something to do with the map designs. In addition to handling the behavior for each level card, the tile and completion data are used to inform a whole host of other state machines. An obvious example here is the model that handles Mario's movement. One way to think about the map is as a special data structure called a graph, where the nodes are placed at traversable tiles, and the edges represent the roads between those tiles. Each node can be thought of as a state, with the edges representing a set of transitions between those states. The transitions are triggered as a result of controller input, which in and of itself is modeled by more state machines. Entities like the Hammer Bros and the Airship can inhabit the map alongside Mario and move independently according to their own logic, and the graphics for all the characters, along with that of certain background tiles, are handled by special animation state machines. The Dancing Palm Trees in Level 2, for instance, use a simple machine that bounces between just a few states. The game keeps a special counter, called a timer, so that it knows when to perform each transition, and stores the state as an index value in RAM. Every time the game loop runs, the index is used as an offset for a lookup table that tells the program which sprite to display. The overall effect is a fun and simple animation that takes a largely static scene and brings it to life. Technically, it's possible to create one giant monolithic state machine that models all the things going on at the same time, but that would kind of defeat the purpose. It's important to remember that state machines aren't the program itself. They're tools that can help you break a problem down and understand its constituent parts. Sometimes game logic can be complex and hard to articulate, but if you can model that logic using a set of simple state machines that work cooperatively, then programming games becomes much, much easier. The channel has been growing real fast. It's exciting and somewhat overwhelming, and I'm just really thankful to everyone who's been watching, subscribing, and leaving feedback. If you like what I do and want to see me do bigger and better things, consider pledging your support at patreon.com forward slash nesshacker. Patrons get a slew of perks, including behind the scenes updates, outtakes, and bonus content in between episodes. Anyway, thanks for watching and see you next time.